I'm so glad you're here tonight. I'm glad you're enjoying visiting, but let's go ahead. We're running a little late with the program, so uh, let's get started. Um, just to let you know, we have had a, a lot going on since our last meeting in October. The Native Plant Project, I'm going to need to see a little bit, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> the Native Plant Project was at Planta Nativa on October 26th at the seed giveaway booth, and we shared a lot of information about native plants and gave away 450 to 500 little packets of native seeds uh, while we were there, and we did a lot of outreach and told everybody about what we do, so it was a real good venture. We hope to be there next year. Also, the Native Plant Project uh, was at the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival in Harlingen. That's our, uh, we work the trade show. We have a booth there every year. It's our major uh, fundraiser for the year. And we sold 189 native plants um, and talked to a lot of people about native plants, shared a lot of information. This year, for the first time, we had a children's nooks uh, stopover station where the children and looked at different types of leaves to try to learn about the leaves of native plants, their structures, the way they felt, the way they smelled. And Christina Miles set that up for us and we had a magnifying glass for him to look through. So that was a really good thing. And I think we'll probably be doing that one again next year also. Um, and I wanna personally thank all of the members that came together as volunteers to help with that. Um, you all did an excellent job. I mean, it was it was ran very smoothly and I certainly appreciate that. Um, the Native Plant Project does not meet in December. We will meet again in January on the 23rd. And January is always our annual membership meeting where the membership comes and votes on the members of the board uh, for the next year. And uh, also it's the only meeting uh, that where the board provides refreshments. So there'll be snacks for anybody that comes and uh, we hope to see you all there. Um, our speaker for January 23rd will be Joey Santori. He's the author and director of the YouTube program entitled Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't. And he's going to be speaking on the concept of kill your lawn. So uh, after the program this evening, please check out the native plants that we have over here provided on the table for a donation. And also we have our handbooks over here for sale. Uh, so be sure and stop by before you leave. Okay, that's all the announcements. At this time, I want to introduce our speaker. And I have to add a personal word here. Um, if you've been involved with native plants, uh, promoting them for years like I have, you see a lot of good people come and go, a lot of good naturalists. Some of the founders of the Native Plant Project were very brilliant men and women. Some of them are no longer living. Some of them have moved away, retired. A few have gone to Austin and had hold state positions now. And so uh, sometimes, I start to think, what's going to happen? You know, uh, what's going to happen to the native plants? Who's going to keep promoting them? What are we going to do? And then somebody young and inspiring and intelligent, like our speaker this evening, John Brush, comes along and recently married. And hope springs eternal in my heart. <laughs> so, yeah, so I really appreciate that Thank about you, John. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about John. He's the urban ecologist for the city of McAllen. He received his master's in biology from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley in 2016. And he's, he studied how suburban bird communities are influenced by local environmental variables. He spends most of his time at Quinta Mazatlan, where he oversees rewilding restoration projects and develops community partnerships. He gives educational programs and serves as a park naturalist. Tonight, John's presentation is entitled Heat and Drought Tolerant Plants, 
for residential landscaping in our cities. And I think it was at least partially inspired by our past summer <laughs> with the record heat yes, it was. and the drought and the lack of rainfall. Uh, so having said all that, I present to you our speaker for the evening, John Brush. Thank you, Jan. Here. Thank you for all the kind words. Uh, Thank you for all the kind words. Oh, you're welcome. So yeah, as Jan mentioned, this was definitely a response to this past summer. It was, I think, sometime in June or July, and we were how many days over 100 degrees in a row at that point? And I was like, wow, everything's brown. But there are certain plants that remain green and thriving, even in that crazy stretch of summer that we had this year. Um, and so this ended up coming out of that. I was just like, well, let me delve into a little bit more of specific species that are tailored for this sort of um, this sort of summer. Um, because a little cheat sheet, it's not gonna it's not gonna get too much better. Um, this last this year was an outlier, 2023. Um, we are already experiencing more extreme heat than historical averages. So this data comes from the uh, Climate Explorer from the NOAA. Um, and you can see here in the gray is our historic average from 1960 to 1990, the number of days in a year that break 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, 1990 in Hidalgo County is around 11 in that 30 year period. Last year, we had <laughs> close to 90. By the numbers, we're projected to steadily increase in the 2030s, in the 2040s, and the 2050s. So we are going to be hotter going forward. That is, that is by all accounts, what's gonna happen. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like Every year is going to be a 2023 summer. Seems like it's a little bit of an outlier, but still, um, it's going to be warm as we progress. We're also going to be having to deal with um, increased water demand. All right. So this is a picture of Falcon Dam, uh, Falcon Reservoir at 100% capacity in December 1992. There are other years that you can go back to, but this was one that I could actually get satellite imagery from. Um, so that's what it looks like, 100% capacity. That's what it looks like at 30% capacity. Let me just flip back a couple times just so you can see the shrinking there. And then last year, in 2022, we reached our all-time low of 9.5% capacity in Falcon Reservoir. Um, right now, I think we're hovering somewhere around 13 14% at the moment. So still pretty low um and I, there was some quote i think from barry goldsmith at some point how it would take several hurricanes to get us back um to close to closer to full capacity someone can correct me on that but that's what i remember hearing and we know that so uh that is reflecting um in terms of water demand right so the reason we don't have as much water in the dams anymore is because our our demand for water is increasing and it's going to continue to increase going forward uh, so this is from the texas water development board 2022 state water plan population wise let me see here uh, population wise we're going to grow right uh, right now irrigation is the largest water demand in this lower chart here the green or the bluish green color there is what percentage of water use by region goes towards irrigation. So here in region M, where we are down at the bottom, it's about 75% of our water is going towards irrigation at the moment. And that's going to be true where irrigation is the largest water demand in Texas through 2050, but city water demand is expected to top that off starting in the 60s, 2060s. And this key tidbit here, if we don't start implementing conservation strategies, a large chunk of the Texas population in 2070 could have less than half the municipal water they would need in a series in a period of drought. Um, so kind of scary stuff. And our region, Region M, is expected to have the largest percentage population growth in Texas over that time period as well. So 
we have low, we have a lot of water demand, it's only going to get more. So we have to plan our urban landscapes with those two facts in mind. And fortunately, we have a lot of opportunity to conserve water in our urban landscapes. Um, I've thrown this gem around a lot ever since I found it a couple this uh, stat a couple years ago. Uh, there's this article in the Water Journal of Texas by Cabrera et al. And it says that almost half, 46% of Texas municipal water use goes to urban spaces dominated by lawns and turf grass. That's a lot of water just going to have grass that's not really performing a whole lot of ecological functions for wildlife. It's not performing a whole lot of ecosystem services for people either. It's not cooling our, our cities as much as trees would. Um, and so we can do better, right? We can do better than that. So replacing just some amount of our lawn helps like we've done at Quinta over the years, but we can get even more specific by looking at what's already been happening here in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and then by looking at more drier, ha at drier habitats that are here in the valley. Um, so this is Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge from 1995. Um, and there's 2023. So this process of zerification or desertification has already been ongoing in our natural or, or undeveloped, I should say, undeveloped habitats here in the Rio Grande Valley. So here in 1995, we've got pretty contiguous tree canopy cover over most of these chunks of Santa Ana. So keep your eyes in this area here and then compare that to 2023. Um, I've always, I've kind of partially because it was my dad that did it <laughs> with a grad student, but I've always kind of held this paper in the back of my mind thinking about plants here in the valley and drought tolerance and resiliency. They did a study where they compared the forest at Santa Ana and the bird communities that use it to a study in, done in the 1970s at the same exact part of Santa Ana. So their main focus was on the birds, but they also kept track of the habitat changes. They found that over that 30 year, 20 year span between the 70s and 90s, more verdans were there, more roadrunners were there, and more uh, mockingbirds were there before. And other species that use more riparian habitat were falling out. There were not as many of them as there used to be. And here comes some kicker here. With a broken canopy that averaged about 10 meters lower than in the 1970s. So between 1970s and 1990s, they had a drop of about 10 meters of average canopy cover at, at this particular part of Santa Ana. And the death of many of those large trees that provided that canopy cover allowed for plants that are more tolerant of dry conditions, like Brazil, spiny hackberry, low bush, and kalima, to invade the study site. And the absence of adequate soil moisture, the new climax or the new steady state of that forest is more thorn forest than it used to be. So this process of zerification is nothing new. Um, it's related to the building of Falcon Dam back in the 1950s to where these riparian forests that used to be much more frequent along the Rio Grande are no, lotting, no longer getting um, semi-annual or annual flooding like they historically would. There's not refill of these old rasakas or these low-lying areas so that these large trees can just suck up water and grow to be 70, 75, 80 feet tall. And so that made me think, okay, know that this desert, desertification has been happening, right? Less water for these plants to use. Species that are more common in drier habitats in the valley are now kind of coming into these former riparian sites. Let's look at those drier habitats, those hotter and drier habitats in the valley for inspiration of what plants we should be using in our urban landscaping for drought tolerance in particular. Um, I love these two resources. I highly recommend everybody download the International Borderland of, Con of Conservation Concern. That's a 2016 report by uh, Leslie Jr. Um, and it's a follow-up to one that they did in the 90s, I believe. 
and it's just chock full of information about biodiversity, about habitat change, about all sorts of things here in the Rio Grande Valley. So I went through and they have these floristic summaries where they describe the different kind of ecosystem types here in the valley and what are the common species of plant in there. So I took those and I went into NatureServe Explorer, which is something that the Nature Conservancy um, is in charge of or works with. And I looked at two particular types of habitats or ecosystems here in the Rio Grande Valley. I looked at Tamalipan mixed deciduous thorn scrub. This is a pretty widespread habitat type here in the Rio Grande Valley. You'll see it at places like Santa Ana. You'll see it here at Valley Nature Center. You'll see it Benson, Quinta Mazatlan, McAllen Nature Center, so on and so forth. A lot of that can kind of be considered under this Tamalipan mixed deciduous thorn scrub habitat type. A lot of mesquite, a lot of granjano, a lot of lope bush, those sorts of plants. So I looked at that. There's the actual description of that habitat type, if you're interested. And then the other one that I looked at was this Tamalipan calcareous thorn scrub. And this is found in more western parts of the Rio Grande Valley. So you have to get out into kind of western, northwestern Hidalgo County, and you have to get out more specifically into Star County um, to see a lot of this sort of habitat. So this is actually at one of the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife tracks out near Rio Grande City. Um, that's open to the public, by the way. So if you want to walk out there and see some cool plants, you can. Um, and so drier and hotter out in Star County. And what I did is I took all the different plant associations within those habitat types. So they have these different clusters of plants that they document as growing near to each other or in proximity to each other as parts of these associations. And I took every single one of those plants and every single one of the associations and I put them all into a spreadsheet. And I looked for the most frequently recurring species. And my goal here was not only I like messing with spreadsheets, but I also wanted to try to eliminate my own sources of my, my own biases, right? Because I've got my favorite plants like everybody does. But I wanted to try to find a way to make it a little more um, meth meth methodological. I guess that might be the word. Um, methodical. Thank you. I appreciate that. And really, so an association is just based off of overall species composition. And then I turned it into a blog post um, for my blog site. So if you want to go back and get the full list of plants, you can, you can check it out on that Center for Urban Ecology. It's qfornature.wordpress.com. But if you just look up Center for Urban Ecology McAllen, you'll, you'll get it popping up there. And I had to narrow down the original list for brevity's sake. Otherwise, it would have been a huge, huge blog post, and this presentation would be way longer than it, than it currently is. So that said, that's the, that's the kind of the background of why I've been thinking about drought resilient and heat resilient plants and kind of how I came to the list that we're about to cover right now. Um, and I tried to kind of group it by um, similar plants, either in terms of relationships, so taxonomically, or in terms of kind of functionality or the, the, the type of plant they are, how they grow. So one of the most frequently mentioned plant groups in this spreadsheet that I generated from all those associations data were the legumes, bean, bean, bean plants. And that makes sense because beans are, are either, I think are either a third or a fourth largest family of plants here in the Rio Grande Valley. Grasses is the largest. And then you got your asters, your composites, so sunflowers and the type. And then I think next comes legumes. And there are over 90 species considered native to the Rio Grande Valley. But these were the ones that popped up the most frequently over these plant associations. And we'll cover a few of them in a little more detail, but we got honey mesquite. Just a note here. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Just a note here, but the genus has changed. It is no longer Prosopis. They, so they split it into Neltuma. Now Prosopis is an old world genus and not a new world genus. So I shed a few tears for Prosopis, but now, now I am on to embracing Neltuma. The other, the other Pros former Prosopis that changed is Tornillo 
or the dwarf screw bean. Um, and now it is Strombocarpa. So it happens. Scientific names changes, change. Just like the uh, Wisache and the Wisachio all used to be in the genus Acacia, and now they're Vachelia. So that happened at some point too. Um, but these are the 10. We got honey mesquite, we got Wahio, Blackbrush Acacia, Texas Ebony, Thornillo, Wisachio, Texas Palo Verde, Wisache, Kinneywood, and Retama. Bonus about legumes is that a lot of them um, form cool mutualistic relationships with the nitrogen-fixing bacteria in their roots. These are the roots of a Texas Ebony I was transplanting. And you can see all these little nodules. And if you want to learn more about nodulation and the associated vegetative growth, I would highly recommend talking to Stephanie Casper, um, who works is in the crowd here and works at UTRGV, and she studied nodulation um, for her master's thesis. So let's go into a few, few little more depth about some of these particular plant species. And a lot of times with mesquite, local folk. You might get the reaction from local folk, I shouldn't generalize, but you might get the reaction of, oh, it's a mesquite. A little bit of a, it's a weedy tree, and don't worry about cutting them down, it's not a big deal, um, it's just mesquite. But mesquite is an awesome plant, it's an awesome tree, and I think we should appreciate it a lot more than, than we do. Um, one, the beans are edible. So you can dry them and grind them and turn them into all sorts of delicious foods. I am particularly fond of mesquite beer bread. That's a really fun recipe to try. Um, and then mesquite pizza dough is really good too. Stephanie and I have put um, mole sauce on pizza, on that, that pizza dough, and it turned out really well. Highly recommend mesquite for that. They are extremely resilient trees. In, in some dry contexts, their roots can go almost 200 feet down into the soil. Um, in more wet contexts, they're not going to go as deep. They'll, they'll kind of spread out more. Um, and they're hard to kill. I don't know if you've ever cut down a mesquite, but they will re-sprout from root and they'll just keep coming back time after time after time. Um, and they serve as nursery trees for other species. So in savanna habitats, when you have a mesquite that pops up, oftentimes they're kind of like a little hot spot for other woody plant species to colonize that particular microclimate. Birds are coming in, landing in the mesquite branches, they're pooping, they have just enough shade to where those baby plants that have been pooped out as seeds can grow um, and, and then be supported by that microclimate. One particularly cool example of mesquite serving as a nursery plant is over some of our native cacti. Um, these are, I believe, Berlandier's um, hedgehog cactus, or a, a kind of serious Berlandier, I think. Um, and this is at former Chihuahua Woods Preserve here in South Texas. I think now it's called Pixie Preserve um, by the Butterfly Center folks. But you have this nice overstory canopy of mesquite, and you can have your beautiful flowering prickly pear and other cacti below it. So there's mesquite. I think mesquite should be used a lot more. Then we have what I'm calling the Vachelia trifecta. We've got three different plants in the genus Vachelia. We've got black brush acacia, super common one, um, especially out in Star County. We've got Wisache, common everywhere in the valley. And then we've got Wisachio, which you'll see a lot in kind of ranch country and out in the, out in the uh, Star County Hills as well. Um, all of them have really pretty flowers, and they mostly bloom in February and March. So if you want to have these just incredibly showy landscapes at that time of year, plant some of these Vachelia trees. And they smell fantastic too, and they attract a lot of pollinators, and they're just gorgeous to look at. Um, Wisachio is basically just like a little Wisache in terms of kind of how it looks. Then we've got the green stems. So we've got the genus Parkinsonia, we've got the Retama, and we've got the Texas Palo Verde, Par Parkinsonia culiata and Parkinsonia texana. Um, and they do have green stems. And in periods of drought, 
they might lose a lot of their leaves, but still photosynthesize just from the stems. Um, but I think these would make fantastic street trees because they make fantastic street trees elsewhere in the country. So in a lot of the southwestern states like Arizona and New Mexico, they will have Palo Verdes um, as street trees. And then every spring, you get these just these swaths of yellow um, going along going along their streets there and their boulevards. And it's just absolutely gorgeous to look at. Oh, and the Ratama beans are edible too. So you can have some, some yummy there as well. So really in our area, the, the peak for spring blooming is eh, mostly March, April, but even extending into May and a little bit in the summer. Then we've got two legumes that I'm gonna call bee buddies or pollinator pals because I love alliteration. Um, so we've got Wahio, the Senegalia berlangieri, and that's a kind of a smaller legume. Um, it doesn't get probably generally too much taller than like 15 feet. Can any? All right, I just wanna verify with the plant experts here. Um, and then Texas kidneywood, which is a fantastic um, legume for attracting a lot of pollinators. Um, a lot of times when you buy local honey, it'll have wahio. They'll, they'll mention wahio. It's wahio honey. And it's kind of a sought after, a sought after one. Oh, one benefit about both of these plants is that they're not very thorny. A lot of the previously mentioned legumes are very thorny. Um, but Wahio might have a few small spines here and there. I've never encountered really thorny ones. And then Texas Kinneywood just doesn't have thorns. So um, if you want some non-thorny uh, yard plants or street trees, those are, would be good ones for you. And as I mentioned before, you can have your beans above and then your cacti below. So a lot of times when you get out and you're looking for cacti, you're not looking out in the open. You're looking underneath this partial shade provided by a shrub or one of these small legume trees. So things like the nipple beehive cactus in the upper left will grow under these, wahio and things of, of that nature. The ladyfinger cactus, oh, that's what it was. In the mesquite image, it was ladyfinger cactus. It was not Berlangier's. Um, and then strawberry cactus will grow in these clusters kind of underneath these woody shrubs as well. So some nice companion plantings there. And then if I'm mentioning some drought resilient plants, I would be remiss to not mention some of these thorn forest, thorn scrub OGs, the original gangsters. We've got Granjeno on the left. That's a classic one. This is probably the most dominant mid-story tree shrub that, that Quinta Mazatlan. Um, and it's really cool. Uh, the fruits are great for wildlife and they're great for people too. They're tasty. So you can pop them in your mouth as you're going along in the summer for a little uh, little snack there. And then Guayacan is absolutely gorgeous when it flowers with those purple pink flowers. Uh, narrow leaf forestiera or elbow bush would be another good choice, um, as would manzanita uh, or wild crepe myrtle, the Malpighia glabra. And I think a lot of our thorn forest plants would be great to use in hedgerows um, in, our, in our towns and cities or along walking trails. Um, why don't we have more walls of vegetation along our trails providing shade, providing habitat, and in some cases for some of our native plants providing some tasty snacks as well at the same time. So any of these following plants I think could do well um, as a hedge or a thicket, or if you want to have them more spaced out individually as an ornamental substitute in our towns and cities. So you got Granjeno, Cenizo, Lotebush, Guayacan, Colima, Brazil, Coma, Fiddlewood, so on and so forth. And we'll cover some of these in particular. So these two I wanted to highlight as instead of small trees, a lot of times at businesses, um, people like to plant these kind of small to mid-sized trees because they can be kind of easily contained. They fit into a space well. Um, and a lot of times the kind of the default tree that a lot of people use is crepe myrtle in our situation, right? Um, I think both of these would be great instead of trees, instead of crepe myrtle. Um, 
because they have the same general size. Um, the Texas persimmon even has a similar bark to crepe myrtle, um, where it's kind of this grayish with patches to it. Um, and some places are already using them in ornamental landscaping, like the HEB in Edinburgh off of Freddie Gonzalez and McCall. So if you're in that part of the valley, uh, I would highly encourage you to go to that HEB and check out the beautiful coma, the beautiful coma trees. They've also got a Nakawita over there. Um, and sometimes you'll walk through and you'll be like, wait, where is that smell coming from? And then you realize the gorgeous smell is the coma trees. Um, and they just recently flowered over the past month or so. Spiny and spectacular. Um, prickly pears. I did bring some prickly pear for folks. If anyone wants to take any, I've got too many in my yard, so uh, y'all can take some. And then Spanish dagger or the yucca treculiana, I think would be fantastic choices. These, uh, these flowers here of the Spanish dagger are edible. You can eat them raw. You can toss them in with your eggs, stir fry them with some onion. Um, absolutely delicious. Highly recommend, highly recommend that. And they're an they're a early spring bloomer for the most part. And then our prickly pears. We have various Apuntia species. I think we have somewhere between four to five species that you can find in the valley. But our most common is um, probably the Texas prickly pear, the Apuntia lintimeri. And then we also have this Alta, this tall prickly pear um, that's pretty common in the area too. But again, you could have prickly pear hedges that are providing nopalitos and are providing tunas for making margaritas with or whatever else you want. And we could have them right in our towns and cities and not have to water them and just have them growing there. Also, apparently some places, um, they'll use prickly pear as a fence alternative, which makes sense, right? So just plant a whole bunch of prickly pear and you don't need to have a barbed wire fence because you've got a living barbed wire fence. Um, and with yuccas, we use ornamental yuccas all the time. Why don't we just switch over to our, our local species there? Some sun-loving shrubs. So things like shrubby blue sage, uh, Mexican oregano, daniana, and skeleton leaf goldeneye are all really drought tolerant plants. They do really well in full sun. So if you have a sunny yard and for three of them, you can make teas or eat them. Um, you know, it's not the skeleton leaf golden eye, but you know, you got your Mexican oregano and your shrubby blue sage uh, and the Damiana is a, is a popular tea as well. But these are all species that you'll see growing out in the thorn scrub habitats in the Rio Grande Valley. Not to mention, they also are all very good su supporters of local pollinators as well. Blue mists for the butterflies. So we've got um, more species of mist flower than just these two, but I like to highlight these two because they bloom at kind of different times of year, uh, where the crucita on the right blooms much more heavily in the fall months, and the Tamalipan spring mist flower on the left blooms much more heavily um, in the early, late winter, early spring months. So if you want to have kind of nonstop mist flower blooming for a significant chunk of the year, you just need to get a few of each of these um, and plant them in your full sun or probably more likely partial shade, um, like under a mesquite tree, for example and you'll have a lot of really nice flowers um, for butterflies. And queens just absolutely love these. If you're here in, in, well, the butterfly festival happens in early November, and that coincides very nicely when the crucita is blooming the heaviest. So they'll just gather, all the butterfly watchers will just gather at these flowering stands of crucita just to see all the different butterfly species coming into the, uh, coming into the crucita. And then we've got some wildflowers um, and grasses. And a lot of these are my personal picks. Just a full, full on disclaimer here. These were not from my uh, mythology, uh, from my methods of selecting the other ones. These are species that I have used in my yard or that I have used um, at, my, at my workplace. 
um, or that I've seen growing in really, uh, really dry areas like roadsides. So I wanted to share this photo because this is along my walkway here. Uh, front door, I've got a, maybe a stretch of like 40 to 50 feet along the right side of my walkway. And it's just a mix of um, upright prairie coneflower and goldenrod and some other uh, onless bush sunflower mixed in. But when I took this photo, this was in, I think it was June or July of this year, I had not watered it all supplementally all summer. It was just sitting there. Now I'm lucky because my yard apparently has really good soil, so it holds moisture really well. But that just goes to show you that you can have vibrant green wildflowers and grasses, native grasses without giving it a, a whole lot of supplemental water. And we'll go through some of those some species. Um, and just a few weeks ago, after that summer of not giving them any supplemental water, the goldenrod were blooming, the bush sunflowers were blooming, the tridax daisy were blooming, and there are all sorts of pollinators going to them. So not only did they survive, but they were flowering like crazy and doing their fulfilling their ecological role um, to support pollinators. So these are some of my personal picks here. And we'll go through some, some individuals as well, but cow pen daisy, prairie coneflower, goldenrod, rama, firewheel or Indian blanket, whichever you prefer, onless bush sunflower. I, I'm combining both of the thymophila species together. There's two different ones that are pretty common here in the valley. And then there's a really rare one that grows out in the Western part of the valley, um, but they kind of serve similar roles. Um, in in our in our uh, Rio Grande Valley habitats, hooded windmill grass. I love sticky Florestina, my friend Florestina tripteris. And then, as odd as it is, I feel like I have to mention common sunflower as an option because yeah, they grow everywhere, which is well how you know that they're so drought resilient and and hardy is that they will grow in fallow fields that are not getting watered will grow to be eight foot tall and just covered in flowers. Um, so if you want, if you have a few sunflowers, they would they would serve a, a really good purpose. Um, and some of these plants you can see as you're driving north on 281 or driving out on these country roads where they're not getting supplemental water. Um, the soils are sandier, so they're not holding as much water. Um, and so these plants can and will grow and thrive in those sorts of habitats. I think a lot of the yellow here is onlish bush sunflower. Um, definitely recommend if you have the time to drive north on 281 come like April, maybe. Um, and there's a lot of cool wildflowers that you can pull over on a rest stop or a historical marker and just walk and, and check around. So let's delve into some of the uh, some of the particulars here. Uh, I mentioned onless bush sunflower a couple times. Um, this is kind of a low-growing, low-growing uh, perennial sunflower. Um, Jan mentioned to me a while back that they have these really uh, thick tap roots, and I have some growing in my yard right now. And I transplanted them out from a single container into multiple, and sure enough, they had some really beautiful, luscious, thick tap roots. Um, so I was really pleased to see that. I always mention cow pen daisy. This is an annual plant. Um, but it's tough as all get out, and it will come back on its own. If you put one in, you'll probably have a patch of it the next year um, because it just is very prolific, does really well in full sun, um, and will will keep going even through summer heat. Upright prairie coneflower is another perennial, so they too have a taproot that they'll come back from, and you can get different flower colors of that upright prairie coneflower. Some are more of this maroon color, some will have more yellow, some are orangey, um, and so you can get a nice color variety from those cone flowers. Um, and then firewheel. You can collect seed for, for whatever reason, maybe someone else can answer this, for whatever reason our local firewheel that I've been finding a lot is more this color. When you buy seed mixes, it's, it says it's the same species, but you'll have more yellow um, in that. Any? Any reason why Jan or or Ken on that? Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is this is definitely one that I collected locally and grew in my yard. Um, and beautiful color there. Um, some grasses. I feel like I would I would be doing a disservice since grasses are our most speciose plant family. Um, if I didn't mention at least a few grasses, slender grama is one that I've been growing for a few years now at Quinta, and um, it does well and it comes back year after year. It's an attractive low growing grass. It doesn't get much taller than knee high for the most part. So if you're looking for a um, kind of a prairie in your lawn that's not going to be like crazy tall and look kind of messy, I think slender grama would be a good choice for you. I, I would want to double check, but I feel like some local ordinances at cities have a cutoff of about two feet of that 24 inches, 18 to 24 inches. And I think slender grama might fit into that. So that, that could be a, a grass alternative there. Um, hooded windmill grass gets a little bit taller than slender grama. Um, but is still a very attractive and has these kind of beautiful spindly um, seed heads. I mentioned sticky florestina. This is a plant that is grows in really disturbed habitats here in the valley. So you'll see it along canals, at the edges of farm fields. Um, but this is a plant that's kind of a southwestern US plant. So it does really well in, in heat and, and low water situations. And then I mentioned those prickly leaves, um, and there's a couple different species that you can see, again, growing in disturbed habitats along canals um, or farm fields. I think one key, no matter what plants we're talking about, um, is to embrace seasonality when it comes to drought tolerance and resilience, because even our most hardy plants, at some point of the year, are going to not be flowering, or they might kind of dry up, they might die back, they might, if they're annuals, they'll die completely, and then survive as a seed for a while. So I think one key point is that we have to learn to accept that we're not going to be green all the time. Other places that experience a winter, they're not green all the time, but I don't see them like trying to force a green grass because they just can't do it, right? doesn't make sense. Our summers are like a lot of northern winters where things will brown up. This is what Quinta Mazatlan, my little demonstration meadow, looked like um, in July of this year. It was brown, things were dying, and did it hurt me? A little bit. I didn't like it, but also it's growing back now. We got all that November rain, and I have lots of baby cowpen daisies coming up. I have lots of cone flowers. I've got my clammy weed. I've got all sorts of things that are coming back now that were surviving the heat of the summer as seeds or as tap roots. And now that we got the rain, they're coming back. So I feel like it's really important to just accept that sometimes a year we shouldn't, we shouldn't fight nature and we should just go with the flow and accept that there's gonna be some browning and there's gonna be some dieback. And then there's things that we can do to make individual plants a little more resilient. So watering correctly, um, when we do have to water, right? If you're just putting something in the ground or you do want to put a little supplement on your plants to keep them a little greener than just not watering at all, you can water more efficiently um, by doing infrequent heavy watering versus frequent light watering. And this is a, the graphic I found from this Virginia Cooperative Extension that kind of showcases the why, right? So if you just water shallowly all the time, those roots are just going to hang out at the surface. They're not going to pursue the water down. But if you give it a heavy soak for you're talking like eight to 10 inches down into the soil where there's moisture, and then that moisture retreats down, you are basically pulling the roots with the water to go down towards those, those, uh, that water source, right? So it's, if by watering in this method, we can create more resilient individuals of already resilient species, right? Um, and then there's some other things we can do to increase the resilience of our plants, like mulching. 
mulching is absolutely fantastic. It traps moisture in, it helps reduce weed pressure, um, and eventually it breaks down and adds a lot of organic material to the soil, which that organic matter helps soil hold water better, right? So by adding some mulch or by adding compost to your plantings, um, you can help that soil preserve what water it does get even longer. Um, and a great way to see this for yourself is plant two plants, put one with mulch, put one with not mulch, and then just give them the same amount of water and see which one has water longer. And it's really easy to tell, tell the difference there. And then also I wanted to throw in that plant death is a part of resilience. Um, I plant many, many plants for my job and not all of them make it. Some of them die. No matter what I do, they die, right? Sometimes even if you're trying to baby your, your plants long, they'll still die. Um, because for whatever reason, there's a virus or a disease or, or a fungus or some other reason, and they just die. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that the ones that survive are the ones that are meant to be in that, in that location at that particular time. And so sometimes just accepting the fact that, yeah, you might plant a whole bunch of a few different species, some won't make it. And the ones that do, you choose to replicate those in your area as well. And before you know it, you end up with these really drought hardy sections of, of our towns and cities where there's prickly pear and there's mesquite and there's a lot of other of our native plants that are providing for our wildlife, providing beauty for us and conserving that water for other uses than just watering our lawns and so forth. And that's it for me tonight. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I just I will note that again, you can find all those species listed on that on that blog site. So if you didn't get the photo of that particular slide, you can find it. And I also want to mention that there are many other plant species that I didn't mention that are also would be really good candidates for uh, drought resistant or or resilient plantings. Um, I didn't mention Tasahio over there to the left of the prickly pear cactus. Those are free to take too. Again, I have too many, so please take them. I'm not taking them back with me. Um, those would be another great choice. So there are other plants. Just because I didn't mention a particular species doesn't mean that it's not. So yes, ma'am. Yeah, it sounds like one of the prickly poppies. So there are a few different prickly poppy species. So you described it exactly. They look like a poppy but then they're spiny and they're prickly, right? And so we've got two yellow ones. We've got the Mexican prickly poppy and the golden prickly poppy. Um, and both of those are, again, really drought resistant. And then we also have one called the red prickly poppy that can be white or pink or purple. Um, and they all, yeah, they're, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think they're a pretty early spring bloomer for the most part, and they might extend a little bit into like May, June. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they might not. I've never tried transplanting one. What I would recommend is, if you do want to try to grow some, wait till they go to seed at the end of the at the end of the season. So go back sometime midsummer when everything is kind of shriveled and dried up, and they've got these really spiky seed pods that kind of split open at the top. Um, and they've got these uh, like almost like peppercorn looking seeds inside. Just dump those into your hand and then toss them out in the fall. Wear gloves. Yes, they're they're very they're very prickly. Yeah, when I, I did, I didn't wear gloves when I transplanted it. And yeah. I grabbed the loose one of all of them because of that. It was very, it hurt. Yeah. Yeah, it hurts. Another thing I didn't mention, but sorry, I saw, I think I saw another hand over there. But another thing I didn't mention is that um, if you can get things, get plants that you're going to plant with that are, I would recommend going with smaller things in pots than trying to get like live transplanted large trees for the most part. You can get you can get a larger tree like that's in a big root ball that's dug out of the ground somewhere and transplanted. And you can have success that way, but it costs a lot more money, 
and the likelihood of it surviving is a lot less. So I would recommend going with smaller individuals in like a three gallon or five gallon pot and just waiting for them to grow rather than cutting off that. Because when you're taking that root ball out, you're cutting all that root material um, and stressing the plant out a lot. And then it takes a lot of water to keep it alive. So maybe just something to keep in mind on that. Did I, did I see another hand? Yes. I, I'm starting to fool around a little more with container gardening. Um, and so I have some, some smaller pots that I grow some of those same species that I mentioned in. I have some of the, have the grama grass growing. I've got palafoxia. I didn't mention that one, but I've got Texas palafoxia growing in a pot, onless bush sunflower. I would recommend trying any of those sorts of wildflower mixes. I would recommend if pot, how deep do you think those pots? Okay. As long as, as long as I, I feel like as long as you have at least a couple feet, at least of room, I think you'll do fine with that. Because again, you can get those roots to go down deep. Um, I, I didn't include it. And in retrospect, I wish I would have, but it didn't come up on my plant association. So I didn't put it in. But hairy wedelia um, is a sunflower plant it's in that family and it's again really drought tolerant it's and it's a slow it's a low growing shrub um, sometimes in times of severe drought and heat it will die back but then it'll come back the minute it rains or you give it a little extra water i also should add that i'm not saying that you should never water for your plants they may come across as that but that's not what i'm saying that's, that's really not what i'm saying i'm saying that especially in contexts where it's harder for our cities to water plants, like some of those roadside trees, we should definitely be using these. But if you're in your yard, I mean, how much water does it take to keep a rotama in your yard happy and green versus it takes to have some ornamental tree happy and green in your yard? It's like a fraction of the water. So I'm not saying don't water. I'm just saying water correctly. Um, and if you're if you're like me and you're stubborn, you can just say I'm not going to water, and if they die, they die, um, and then and then have that hurt for a while. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to me blabber. I appreciate that.